Ukraine, and it will be my pleasure to accompany you as moderator of this panel and also the last panel of the day. So we don't really have to focus too hard, I think, uh, to realize that 2018 was a very bad year for European banks. In fact, it was the worst year, the lowest point of the financial crisis. And uh, just a few of the characteristics of this bad year. As you know, investors fled en masse from the sector. Bank stocks fell on average by 25%. And none of the 16 largest European banks are now trading above book value. A 12-year-old Dutch payments startup has a higher market capitalization, significantly higher market capitalization than either Commerzbank or the Deutsche Bank two banks which I, of course, did not choose randomly. Uh, all that despite the fact that banks actually are safer. In fact, they have doubled their capital buffers since the crisis, as you know. They have offloaded most, if not all, of their toxic assets, and they have returned to core activities. Meanwhile, as Ignacio reminded us earlier, enhanced supervision that helped make the banks safer is also at a crossroads. Will we see stronger convergence in supervisory culture, or will we see renewed fragmentation? The trends that were discussed to some degree in the last panel, from rising nationalism, including Brexit, to economic headwinds, cyclical issues, and emerging technologies, all have crucial implications for the sector as a whole, and also for supervision. So in this panel, we want to focus not only on where we've come from since the financial crisis, but also on where we're going and whether we're well equipped to master new obstacles and risks. We have three guiding questions that are, are proposed in the program. How can we make today's national banking champions truly European? How can financial integration best serve European citizens? And what future uh, is, uh, has the banking union and its relations with UK banks? And of course, on any one of those questions, we could spend our entire panel time, but we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is hear a relatively brief input, and then we're going to have an interactive discussion first amongst us here on the panel, and then also with you, ladies and gentlemen. So I will introduce all of our speakers, and then we will get underway. And I'd like to begin here with our lead speaker. He is the chair of the European Public Affair, of European Public Affairs at the Brunswick Group. In a 20-year uh, career at the European Commission, he became its most senior British official, serving most recently as Director General of Financial Stability, Financial Services, and Capital Markets Union, and as Director General of the Task Force for Strategic Issues Related to the UK Referendum. He was knighted in 2017 for his services to UK relations with the European Union. Sir Jonathan Fowle, great pleasure to have you with us. And I'm very pleased to introduce on my other side, John Barrigan. He is Deputy Director General in the European Commission's Directorate for Financial Stability, Financial Services, and Capital Markets Union, and represents the Commission on the Financial Services Committee and the Single Resolution Board. And he has been with the Commission since the mid-1980s. Great that you can be with us today. And then I will go over here to um, introduce uh, the man who was the first chairperson of the European Banking Authority, Andrea Enria. He turned the stress tests into a valuable tool for gauging balance sheet risk. He previously headed the financial supervisor supervisory divisions at the Bank of Italy and also at the European Central Bank. And as you know, he is now back at the ECB as chair of the supervisory board. Wonderful that you could participate in our panel. And finally, it's always a pleasure to see Philip Hildebrandt. He's vice chairman of BlackRock, a member of the firm's global executive committee and chairman of multi-asset strategies. He previously served as chairman of the governing board of the Swiss National Bank. Great to see you again, Philip. So I will ask Sir Jonathan Fall to get us started with his input. Either, either place, wherever well, you'd like to be. If you don't be. mind, I'll stay here then. Please do. Um, well, dear Ignazio, ladies and gentlemen, it's first of all, as, as others have said, a pleasure and a great honor to be here on this auspicious occasion. Uh, I looked back a little bit over 
uh, some of the things that uh, Ignacio had been writing and saying and doing over the years. Uh, and I came across in more innocent times, 2005, uh, a paper he co-authored uh, entitled, What Does the European Union Do? Uh, you may remember it. Uh, and in a very admirably uh, balanced paragraph, the authors discussed banking and financial markets and said, I quote, in the areas of banking and financial markets, including <clears throat> the related supervisory activities, the arguments for or against centralization are somewhat mixed. On the one hand, the drive towards integration and financial markets is a clear and powerful stimulus to supranational ruling. The economies of scale inherent in gathering supervisory information and the international transmission of financial fragility also speak in favor of centralization, at least up to the geographical level at which financial markets are integrated and significant spillovers exist. On the other hand, however, considering that fiscal and tax policies are decentralized, as they are at present in the EU, and that the costs of bank rescues and the lending of last resort are ultimately fiscal, allocation of banking and supervisory policies at a lower geographical level can also be justified. That was in 2005. A few years later, the question, what does the EU do, became uh, a burning question. What should it do? What can it do? The financial crisis revealed the design faults of economic and monetary union and the weaknesses of the EU's regulation and supervision of financial institutions. Urgent action was called for, and we all, not only the lawyers, uh, we all reached for our treaties. And we found a paragraph which people hadn't read for a while, uh, paragraph 6 of Article 127. Uh, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which miraculously contained a legal basis somehow related to supervision. And I'll read it again because people may have forgotten about it in the, in the intervening years. The Council, acting by means of regulations in accordance with a special legislative procedure, may unanimously and after consulting the European Parliament and the European Central Bank, confer specific tasks upon the European Central Bank concerning policies relating to the prudential supervision of credit institutions and other financial institutions, with the exception of insurance undertakings. Ignazio was one of the few people who had been thinking long and hard about those issues and unsurprisingly became a key protagonist in the creation of the single supervisory mechanism, the first pillar of the banking union. Lawyers looked carefully at those words I just read out. Uh, there were great debates about what does the expression specific tasks mean, uh, what, what does it not mean, uh, and what are policies relating to prudential supervision. It became clear that the creation of a single supervisory mechanism was possible, uh, and uh, so to cut a not very long story short, uh, it was legally possible, it was politically necessary, uh, and it was done. For the sake of brevity, I will pass over the hours we spent together with many others in this room uh, arguing about Moroni. Anybody remember Moroni? Uh, Moroni, for the non-lawyers here, is a court judgment nearly as old as Ignacio and me, uh, 1958, uh, under the Coal and Steel Treaty. Some of you may remember that as well. And, of course, we argued long and hard. In fact, my memory is that we argued more about what to do with the non-Euro countries which may one day want to join the banking union than about some aspects of the banking union itself. So the docking mechanisms for non-Euro countries wishing one day to join the banking union uh, was very much a, a key feature of our discussions. By 2018, Ignacio was able to write, and I quote again, for all these reasons, the objectives of the banking union are deeply consistent with the promotion of the broadest collective interest which the new forces in the European political landscape purport to uphold. The supranational nature of the banking union is also helpful. Pursuing collective interest requires weighing up various types of special interests, which in banking are often vocal and well connected. A multinational supervisor is better placed than a national one in this regard because decisions are made by a supranational body mandated, mandated to enforce a level playing field via 
peer review and peer pressure. And in your remarks this morning, I think you echoed that very clearly. So the balance between European Union and national levels has been readjusted to meet the needs of the times. So let's look forward, not back, as Ignacio clearly prefers. And I will now turn to the, the three questions that uh, you uh, raised uh, in uh, your opening remarks. How can we make today's national banking champions truly European? I leave aside competition policy considerations. I reinterpret the questions as the question is asking how banking policy, the banking policy environment can become more conducive to the emergence of European banking champions. And I also assume that this is something that is desired or desirable. Personally, I would start quite humbly by asking the candidates for this championship, some of whom are in the room, uh, what they think. Uh, there are large cross-border banking groups in Europe. Uh, do they want the title of champion? How uneven is the playing field on which they operate at the moment in the Euro area and the wider European Union? How single do they find uh, the EU's market? I would ask similar questions, by the way, to uh, supervisors. Uh, and uh, we would need an answer to the question, does the newly balanced system in the euro area between the SSM and the national supervisors work in practice, uh, heeding the experience of the SSM itself? How many rule books does it really have to apply? Is there a single rule book or are there 20? Uh, my personal experience uh, shared with Ignacio and others in the room of rapid legislation making radical changes in an emergency is not one uh, that anybody should wish to repeat. We have to learn how to make progress in quieter times as well. The banking union today is coterminous with the euro area, but other members may join, and the mechanisms, as I have said, enabling them to do so are contained in the regulation. So truly European banking champions uh, may well uh, straddle the Eurozone and uh, other currency areas, uh, and keeping the docking mechanisms well oiled and ready for action will continue to be necessary. Nor do I neglect my own poor country, uh, uh, still European, whatever its political relationship with the European Union may be after Brexit. True European bank champions are very likely to have activities in the United Kingdom as well. Uh, and therefore friendly co cooperative coordination mechanisms between the banking union and the British authorities will be important too, uh, and I will say a few words at the end about that. The second question is, how can financial regulation best serve European citizens? Well, quite simply by providing state-of-the-art uh, protection to investors and account holders, by preventing crises, giving those who nevertheless nevertheless have to face crises, a better toolbox than the one we had uh, in 2008. By enabling the financial sector to provide <laughs> high quality service to public authorities, to companies, to individuals, boosting economic growth and welfare, and by giving uh, the sector the economies of scale and scope to compete with its counterparts all over the world. And finally, uh, by making finance in Europe sustainable uh, and worthy of public respect. To quote another influential Italian, the president of this august institution, uh, EU countries uh, acting together in their union have a unique capacity to ensure that globalization is not a race to the bottom on standards, rather the EU is able to pull global standards up to its own. Finally, the third question, what future is there for the banking union and its relations with uh, the United Kingdom? I will try to be positive in answering both questions. Banking union has to be completed in at least two ways, enhancing the current pillars uh, uh, and uh, adding deposit insurance. I will quote yet another influential Italian sitting not very far away from me. And by the way, that enables me to say something I often think, and why not say it here, the contribution of Italy, and I see several eminent Italians just looking out at this room, and I can think of others back in Brussels and elsewhere, the contribution of Italy to uh, this part of the European Union's work has been quite extraordinary and continues to be so. So another influential Italian, Andrea, uh, uh, wrote recently, there are still ob obstacles 
to the integrated management of bank capital and liquidity within cross-border groups operating in the banking union. This is also hindering the prospects for cross-border mergers, which are necessary to reduce the excess capacity we still have in the system. The smooth operation of the SSM requires a high degree of harmonization as the application of different rules and processes in each member state unduly complicates the conduct of supervisory tasks and jeopardizes the level playing field. Finally, on the United Kingdom, uh, a bridge to the UK has to be uh, designed, built, and maintained. The traffic across it will be heavy, it will be important, so it must be robust and durable. I suggest that it should be based on equivalence of rules and enforcement practice with outcomes tested regularly, underpinning reciprocal market access and a coordinated approach in international fora. It will be based on existing notions, but it will also be new and unique given the historical relations and common experiences between the two sides and uh, the importance of the City of London for the rest of Europe. Ignacio, thank you for all you have done for Europe and for Europeans. May you continue to make your priceless contribution for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Jonathan, also for that very elegant tribute to Ignacio. And I think a lot of us were hoping that you would take guiding question number three as the opportunity to tell us what will happen in the House of Commons. But uh, perhaps we can tease that out of you later on in the discussion. Let me start out with that first guiding question on European champions. And Sir Jonathan suggested that we start out by asking the champions, but since we don't have a champion on the panel. However, what we do have is, uh, is one of the largest shareholders in many big European <laughs> banks. So I will go straight away to Philip Hildebrand, uh, who recently said that the European banking industry, I quote, is in the midst of a painful, painful transition, end quote. And it might take several years before it can reemerge as an attractive place to invest. Would you say European champions are essential to make that happen, to restore that attractiveness? And if so, what are the steps that need to be taken to create a fertile ground for them to develop? Thank you, Melinda, and thank you, Nazia, for having me here. It's wonderful to be back. It seems so small now, as somebody else said. <laughs> I remember in the beginning, this league seemed like a big place. Um, that's an easy question for me. I, I can only get myself in trouble no matter what I say, so let me be careful and yet say something real. Um, so I spent probably too much of my early life in sports. And, and when you talk about champions, typically in sports, it means peak performance, right? Um, now, as an investor, you look at data. If I look at these two institutions today, in terms of the data, you have a situation where over a five-year total return performance, <laughs> including dividends and whatever else you produce, you're looking at one of them minus 70 percent so total return. Sec. I didn't actually mention the names, Commerzbank and Deutsche Bank, <laughs> but I guess that's where you're going. <laughs> uh, the other one minus 45 percent. They're trading today at price to book. One of them roughly 0.2, the other one roughly 0.3. So when you talk about performance, or at least if you define, and this is how I would define champions, you know, it is not size per se, as these numbers indicate, by the way. Uh, it's about performance. Um, size may be a way to performance. At JP Morgan today, if you look at the same uh, numbers, you know, JP Morgan is total uh, return over those same five years in excess of 100% and trading price to book at 1.4, let's say, 1.5. Um, but size per se is not the definition of a champion. There are many great champions who are not very big. In fact, in sports, typically being too big doesn't help. Uh, so I think the question really is completely misguided if it's looked only through size, but you have to think about what are you trying to solve for 
uh, when you talk about creating an even uh, bigger institution. And that's true for these two, but it's also true for any other discussion of, of mergers. So what problem are we trying to solve here? I think that's the part, at least from my perspective and you know, as, a, as an investor, that part is yet missing in this discussion. I can imagine, and I won't be long, but I can imagine certain arguments where you're trying to solve for something that makes sense. I can also imagine a lot of stuff that doesn't make any sense and won't work. The top of my list, and maybe that's more of a personal statement, uh, is the one thing that I'm convinced will not work is if you try to solve or if your objective in this operation is to try yet again to create a sort of a, a large US-inspired investment bank operation through stealth. Uh, I won't go through all the various other things that you might be able to solve for, and some of them might make sense. But the bottom line here, and this is what I referred to in the quote you used the other day, uh, we have a significant, severe business model problem, and you cannot solve this simply by way of size. So the, the question has to be, or the, we have to see as investors a specification of what problem uh, are they trying to solve for. Uh, and if it's just size, that's not a sufficient answer. Andrea, Andrea, our question asks, sorry, is my mic on? Yes. Our, our question asks how we can make national banking champions truly European, but I'd take a step back and, uh, back and say, do we need to do so? Do you see that as a legitimate goal uh, also for the way that we structure and conduct supervision? Well, I, I say this publicly already. I mean, I, I don't like the reference to champions. I don't like the reference to national champions. I don't like the reference to European champions. I think that, again, from a supervisory perspective in particular, you should look uh, at the, uh, I mean, as Philip was saying, I mean, the solidity of the business project and what, uh, let's say, uh, and what in general is being, is being uh, obtained in the markets. What I'm concerned about is to see, a, as you said in your introductory remarks, is to see a, a banking sector in Europe which is increasingly perceived by investors as uh, not a, 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 an attractive investment proposition. And that, for me, as supervisor, is a, is a serious uh, concern. You want banks that uh, thrive, that are able to attract capital investments, and not only from their own country, from, uh, let's say, globally. So uh, from, the, from the supervisory perspective, I think that what I'm concerned about is mainly to understand what is dragging down the, uh, the uh, profitability of the, of the European banking sector. And here the point of, uh, uh, of integration, which was a little bit also the, the second question, so if you allow me, I will. Uh, I mean, the, 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 there are different uh, issues which are at the moment, in my view, uh, creating problems in terms of uh, de developing a, a fully function, a well-functioning European banking market and European banking sector. The first one is the fact that uh, uh, we didn't have enough uh, elimination of the excess capacity created in the run-up to the crisis, and so we are still clogged with uh, excess capacity in the system, which uh, of course uh, means that there are banks which are active in the market. Uh, um, they don't have a viable business model, probably. They try to stay alive by being very aggressive in terms of uh, uh, pricing and the eroding margins also of, let's say, more solid uh, uh, franchises. Uh, you have, of course, a, a low interest rate environment, which is uh, likely to remain for a, for a while. Uh, you have uh, something which is, uh, and this is a, a, an area in which we as supervisors are putting pressure on banks, levers that the banks can activate in terms of cost reduction, in terms of investing in new technologies, and uh, maybe thinking better about uh, where they want to be a few years from now. And, uh, and, and finally, but most importantly, my point of view, from the policy point of view, you need to make the euro area at least as a genuine uh, domestic jurisdiction for European banks. And that's where we get also to cross-border mergers. I mean, uh, again, 
I, I find also the questions sometimes I receive uh, whether I prefer domestic mergers or cross-border mergers misleading. No, I, I understand that there could be business cases in some, sometimes to have a domestic merger because you have uh, more room for efficiency gains if you have uh, overlapping distribution networks and the like. But the point is, if I have impediments, as we do now in the, in the, in the euro area, to have cross-border banking to move capital and liquidity freely within our own domestic market, well, then you have a big impediment to cross-border mergers and you crystallize this excess capacity that you have in the, in the market. And I think that's, uh, that's very detrimental. Sean Bergen, sometimes it seems like we're in a strange kind of limbo for example, with uh, European Banking Union, that we can't quite go forward. We don't seem to be able to get the job done. We also can't go back. Many people, of course, say that the absence of EDIS and the lack of progress on capital market unions are two of the big structural factors that keep us from being like a domestic market and, and essentially inhibit cross-border mergers. What would what are feasible steps that could expedite progress on either of those? Okay, well, first let me just take the opportunity to say thanks to Ignacio for inviting me to speak today. Uh, our paths have crossed a long time in different roles, uh, and it's always been a pleasure to work with a big brain. Um, his brain, not mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> Look, I, I can give you the sort of standard answer I will give you as a commission official that we need to complete banking union because that's the only way we're going to create uh, integrated banking in Europe. By the way, like Andrea, I distinctly dislike the reference to champions. This comes with a lot of baggage. It comes from a period before the crisis where champions receives preferential prudential treatment. It's one of the reasons we created the SSM was to get away from that. And I think we shouldn't drift back into references to champions. This is about scale and what is the minimum efficient scale of a bank within, it's within Europe. And it's not my job to tell a bank how big to be. It's my job to facilitate a bank growing as big as the market thinks uh, it should and, and allows it. Now, of course, we have a banking union which is half complete. And I make a, maybe one speech a week telling people that when you're halfway across the river, that's a very dangerous place to be. You need to swim to the other side because swimming back is probably not an option. And I think we do need to have a European deposit insurance scheme and we probably do need to have a backstop for the single resolution fund and to complete the banking union. But I think it would be naive for me to stop there and say that if you deliver that, then that's, that's going to solve the problem. Because there's something else, um, the bank, what we're talking here is the framework. This is the kind of architecture. But the reason we're not even able to complete the architecture is that there's some of probably a more fundamental problem in the system, which is one of trust. And this problem of trust is, of course, probably the one least spoken about legacy of the crisis. I mean, we talk about capital hits. We talk about liquidity problems. But probably the most fundamental issue in the crisis was that trust across the system collapsed. Trust between banks began the problem. But then because of the way we managed it, trust, I think, between politicians and financial practitioners like me collapsed. I remember before the crisis, politicians couldn't wait to give technical issues to Jonathan and people like me to get it off their table. Now they keep it very much on their table because they don't quite trust the framework like they used to. I think trust between home state authorities has deteriorated. One of the reasons we won't get EDIS is because member states don't fully trust each other in how they're going to manage crises based on what we had before. Uh, so, and the thing which also bothers me slightly is that we have, in order to overcome this trust problem, we have created central bodies. So in order to overcome this concern that national authorities may treat banks differently, we created central authorities to deliver uniform, high quality supervision uniform, high quality resolution. And yet the trust in these central bodies is not yet fully established. Interestingly, as I think Ignacio said this morning, or I was actually Daniel Gross, the market trusts the central authorities. They even prefer the central authorities to the national ones. But I'm not sure the home authorities fully trust the center. And that means that we're caught in this, what we call in the, in the business, the home host problem. Because if you want to allow scale to be achieved, 
you have to allow banks, first of all, you have to allow capacity to find its level. So banks have to be able to enter, but also exit the market. We still haven't got to a world where Europe can easily allow banks to exit the market, even though we have the framework. You have to allow capital and liquidity and MREL to be efficiently managed across borders. We haven't got there. That's because host countries think about how the, ma how the crisis was managed before and wonder whether or not it'll be managed better, even with these central authorities, even though we argue it will be managed better by these central authorities. And so I think until we, we build this trust again, and this may take a bit longer, I think it's improving, just completing the banking union uh, will not be enough. And I think it's incumbent on those of us who see the, the objective of a banking union as an integrated banking sector with cross-border banks and with scaled banks. It's on us to somehow convince those who are still in, essentially feel threatened by cross-border banking that, in fact, this is the way we need to go. So yes, I think I would like an EDIS. If people have good ideas how to get it, I'm all over ears, but it won't be enough, I think. Thank you very much. Let me move us on to the second of these guiding questions, which is how financial integration can best serve European citizens. And in asking what best serves European citizens, I thought we could come back to something that Ignacio said. He referred to the ultimate purpose that banks are supposed to serve as transforming liquid savings into sound credit to the economy, which sounds self-evident, but I think it helps to crystallize that, that purpose issue. So um, let me start out by asking you, Philip, about something that, of course, is causing a lot of concern and not a little mistrust at the moment, and that is the persistence of the doom loop. And banks that load up on shaky government debt, are they serving that ultimate purpose? Well, I think it's, it's one of the great challenges of integration. You know, proper integration will create more diversification, which will reduce risk. Um, the problem is how we get there. Uh, you were talking about EDIS. You have to have sympathy with the position of certain countries who say, how can we go into a common deposit guarantee scheme or insurance scheme if we still know that we have, you know, particularly if you adjust it for the cycle or the place we're in the cycle, you still have high levels of non-performing loans. So I think this is, a, this is a long time journey. The question is, can we get there without another crisis? If you look at the history, and Guido, you indirectly referred to this, that we kind of make these leave changes. I guess you also showed it in the case of the US, Beatrice. That's been very much the history of, uh, of Europe. The big jump came in 2012, really. And I suspect, or I fear, that to get to the next place, we probably have to traverse yet um, another, another crisis moment, or at least a stress moment. It's very hard to move these things forward in a normal time, particularly when you have the cycle working against you. So I think um, all of this is related. Uh, more scalability, more integration, uh, removing the obstacles, whether it's regulatory, um, or political will actually increase diversification and will reduce risk. But we have these hurdles. Um, sovereign risk is one of them. Non-performing loans is another one that make it very hard to move the political debate forward uh, around the remaining steps um, that are left. I think the other thing we should not forget, and it's related to Ignacio's definition of good banking, you know, Europe, of course, we can aim towards capital markets union, and that's certainly an important long-term goal. But for the time being, the European economy is largely funded by banks. This is something many of my American friends just refuse to understand. Uh, and so the whole debate in Europe has to be a different one. When we talk about scalability in the foreseeable future, we have to think about essentially a traditional banking model uh, with a long-term ambition, we can certainly have that for capital markets. Uh, but we have to be clear as to how Europe functions today. 
you know, if you look at where the employment is generated in Europe, it's largely SMEs. SMEs are funded by banks. I don't care what anybody says, SMEs do not issue bonds. Uh, and so this is why this, uh, this whole discussion about business models is so critical. We have to build these business models around what we need for Europe to serve the European economy. And that has to be strong balance sheets, traditionally oriented banking models that basically uh, fund uh, European corporates, which are largely, if you look at employment, or at least to a, to a very significant extent, are actually not the big global companies. But SME. So the whole discussion gets mixed up because we keep using a sort of US lens of all of this, and I think it's wrong. I think we need to, what Europe needs to do is think about what kind of banking system do we need at scale, if possible, just the way you laid it out, that can serve the European economy. For the foreseeable future, that economy is going to be funded through banks and not through yeah. capital markets. So that's why we need to. It, it, that's why I said it's going to take years. I think this is a fundamental reform, move away from the US-inspired investment banking mess that we've gotten ourselves into since the uh, early mid-90s, and really reorient the entire debate towards a, um, a scalable, if possible, step-by-step, -step, uh, fairly traditional-based banking model that can fund uh, the European economy. Because. Uh much tribute has been paid to Italians. I'll uh, quote another Italian now, um, <laughs> Andrea. <laughs> Andrea, a senior deputy governor of the Banca d'Italia said last summer, uh, quote, European banks have become European only in one sense. They are supervised and resolved at the European level. The vicious link between sovereigns and banks has not been severed, but a straitjacket has been imposed on banks to ensure that should a sovereign experience a flight from its bonds, the country's banks cannot be bailed out by taxpayers. Assuming you agree, maybe you don't, uh, but would that straitjacket suffice to prevent contagion? Well, uh, the idea, I mean, I, I think there is one point in this, in this uh, description which uh, we should uh, reflect about. I, I think it is true that uh, the, I, the banking union has not yet managed to cut this link uh, because the system remains uh, to a large extent segmented along national lines. And what scares me the most is the fact that uh, uh, if, you, if we were to be confronted with a, with a national shock again in the near future, uh, the banking sector uh, will uh, probably continue to play the role of a shock amplifier rather than a shock absorber, as it should be in a banking union. So that's my main concern. And uh, uh, I think the point of, uh, I mean, the exposure uh, to national sovereigns could be an issue, but I, I don't think it's really the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the crucial one. I think that the, the key point is uh, how do you manage, and this is a point on which I think we should look at the US. The point is how do you uh, manage a banking crisis in a way which is not just uh, you know, leaving the hot potato in the hands of the national authorities, because that would create this dissonance that uh, the statement was referring to. And if you look at the US, uh, I think that uh, uh, Daniel Gross has documented this very well in his, uh, in his research. If you have a shock, for instance, in Puerto Rico, which is, uh, uh, like in Greece here, uh, uh, a, a shock hitting uh, a, a state which goes into default, you had the FDIC entering the state, going to the banks, which have been, of course, affected by the, by the, by the local shock, uh, do purchase and assumptions, so take control of the assets and liabilities of these banks, uh, bid them to the best bidder, which usually are banks from other states, and uh, through this channel, you have no impact on the local depositors and borrowers, and you have the banking sector working as a shock absorber. We don't have this now. I mean, we have had, uh, uh, in, in the past years, we have, we have had deployment of the European Financial Stability Fund, so of European taxpayers' money, which has then led to restructuring of the banking sector in different countries, which has been led mainly at the national level, which has meant that consolidation has been only national. So that's, in my view, the, the, the key point. If we, want, if we want to 
overcome this, uh, this interlocking, we need to find ways that if there is a crisis, and this crisis hits a particular member state, goes to the banking sector, you need to have mechanisms to make sure that you are able to solve this at the European level. And uh, let's say, uh, the, the, single, the establishment of the single resolution board, of course, is a great improvement. But sometimes you go to size that will be below the level of uh, direct responsibility of the single resolution board, and you need to be able to provide answers there as well. Thank you very much. Let me pick up on a few of Ignazio's remarks regarding the barriers to supervisory independence and effectiveness, including as a means of financial integration that best serves Europe's citizens. So um, he mentioned the uh, ECB European Parliament dispute over NPL provisioning and referred to legal and analytical hurdles, uh, including the fuzziness of the current process for deciding on desirable levels of aggregate risk. And he called for a change in the law to assign to supervisors a limited, quote, limited but meaningful degree of regulatory power. Would you agree with that, Sean? No. Um. So I started as a commission official and probably would say, I would have to think very carefully about this. <laughs> as a commission official, I would be worried about confusion of roles, okay? Because our role is primarily in, at level one, uh, regulatory. To introduce regulatory powers in another field could introduce a complication in the structure, could introduce conflicts in, in this structure. So as a commission official, I think I'd like to consult my legal service and come back to you on that. Maybe, well, maybe, maybe Jonathan will have a point. Yes, we could come to a former commission exactly. official I, now free to speak to this point. Another big brain on the law side. Now, let me just come out of this commission official and say that I, there is a problem here. We, when we, at least in the commission, considered creating a single supervisor, it was not as effect to get around some of these problems. I remember you know, one of Ignacio's first calls to me, at least, if I remember rightly, when you moved to supervision, was to talk about uh, national discretions and options. And you asked, was it possible for the commission to legislate all of these national discretions out of the system? And I think my answer to you then was, why did I create you? <laughs> I want you to, within I want to leave a degree of discretion within the law, but I want the single institution to make those discretions consistent for the banking union. And we had a very interesting discussion, I think, where you, you know, in, inform me about how difficult it is for supervisors to do these things. But in fact, you went away and did it for 120, leaving about eight, if I remember, member state ones left, which I think last night at dinner, um, Sabine Lautenslager asked me also to remove. Um, now, I would be happy to remove those national discretions if the member states, when we, just, when we talk to the member states about this, about legislating away national discretions, they tell us, you know, my discretion's fine, but the other ones are all <laughs> yes. terrible. So the usual story. So I think I don't know whether you need regulatory powers and whether or not the issue here is whether or not the institutions feel confident enough to use the powers that we give you within the discretion to eliminate those discretions among the participants, among your constituents. So this is a question for your board, essentially. I mean, you don't have to be told by law that you will, that you cannot have discretions. If you're part of a single institution, I would think it should be almost natural that you would say, okay, within the discretion given by the law, because remember, within the law, there are some who are not in the banking union, and they may wish to keep their discretions under the law. So I think it's a, it's a complicated discussion. Um, I said my commission official review would be probably not, because we were one of the people with whom Ignacio had problems with the pillar one versus pillar two, and we took the pillar one side of the argument that this was, in fact, an invasion of pillar one responsibilities. But I also think, just generally, I think the single institutions need to feel more confident 
about using the discretions they have in the law, but to using them in a consistent way. And I can see all the supervisors nodding and shaking their heads at me. But that is how I think when we devise the single institution, we thought the single institution should work. Thank you. Sir Jonathan and then Andrea. Well, I can be frank uh, now. Uh, uh, by the way, you said uh, I did 20 years. I did 40 years in the European Commission. So some of this will... Um, will sound wooden and bureaucratic because it's just the way I, I talk these days. So, <laughs> um, the, uh, Any regulatory system is a balance between rules, discretion, and accountability. The European system is that to the power of 10 because uh, it's not a country uh, and it has its own institutions. You all talk as if I did this, Sean did that. The European Commission... You, you, somebody describes lawmaker. We're not a lawmaker. I was not a lawmaker. You seem to have written out of existence the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers. The member states are still in charge. And if there are discretions, and if, if all the financial regulation that Sean and I used to work on starts with a wonderful principle followed by 27 or 28 uh, national exceptions, discretions, that's because that's what the political market bears. Uh, and that is the struggle we all have to face. So it's not enough for commission officials and supervisors to bemoan uh, the unlevel playing field. We have to, and, and the bankers and, and, and the private sector, we all have to go to governments and say, we are harming ourselves by not having a more level playing field and explaining how, and here the academics and the journalists can help as well if we're right. Uh, and say again and again, we make progress in crisis. The European Union, across the whole range of its activities, bears that truth out. The history of financial regulation in the United States bears that out. What, see the history of the creation of the Federal Reserve. Uh, uh, we have to learn, it's extremely difficult, to make progress in peacetime when we have a little more time to think and act and prepare for what I hope is our great, great, great grandchildren's toolbox when they have to face the next crisis. But there will be another crisis. It'll be different and we won't have foreseen all of it. Uh, but uh, our job, all of us in the different capacities represented in this room, is to think about how this financial system of ours works and try to help uh, deal with the problems that arise. So it is a balance between uh, regulation, discretion, and accountability. Uh, accountability is even more complicated in the European Union than it is in an individual country because you have the European Parliament as well as uh, national parliaments and governments. Uh, and that balance moves over time too slowly. It's always catching up. It accelerates in a crisis, and then the political will uh, um, evaporates. Uh, uh, and uh, we have lots of conferences where we, in the uh, inner circles, talk about what is necessary, and we can't quite figure out how to do it. But I think we have to take the debate back to governments, uh, to the European institutions, which are going to be uh, uh, fundamentally uh, recomposed this year, and of course the union itself, the Brexit is going to be fu fundamentally recomposed, uh, and and make the case again and again for uh, the changes that we think are necessary. Thank you very much. Let me come to Andrea and ask you to address two different aspects uh, of what we've just been talking about, starting with this one uh, that Ignacio raised about uh, the possible need for a delegation. If I understood him correctly, he was basically saying that without an explicit delegation of power, supervisors could find themselves without the room that they need to independently exercise their pillar two powers. Now, you have been speaking quite a bit lately about Pillar 2, so perhaps you could reflect on whether you think that kind of precise delegation is necessary or whether the tools you've been talking about, namely transparency and so on, are enough to get us where we need, or, or essentially enough to give supervisors the leeway, leeway they need and also be effective. I think the point boils down to some extent to the, to the issue of trust that, uh, that Sean was mentioning before. No? Uh, when you start from, from a place where you have uh, 
1928, uh, whatever the dimension you choose, uh, very different approaches and traditions across the Union, the way in which we try to bring these under a common umbrella is to sit around the table, start negotiating and writing papers in which we try to bring these, uh, you know, under a common, uh, a common, uh, uh, a common set of principles. Now, this becomes very much rule-based by construction. It means that uh, you have probably too much detail in level one legislation. A lot of the formulas uh, that you have in the uh, CRD, in the Capital Requirements Directive and Regulation in, in Europe, you find in, uh, in, in, the, in the Fed uh, rule books, uh, which probably don't, are not even approved by the, by, the, by the Federal Reserve Board, but delegated to lower levels in other jurisdictions. Uh, this goes down the ladder all the way. I mean, if you go to the reporting framework that, uh, that are defined, I mean, we are, I think, the only jurisdiction which has uh, the reporting data in the official journal. So basically, to change uh, a, a, a line in the reporting that the banks do, you need to go to legislation. And then goes even maybe down to our own world here in the, in, the, in the ECB. So we do supervision, we do manuals, we do them in the same way. We have groups of national people sitting around the table, and you come out with something that codifies very much you know, the way in which you, you should behave in, a, in, a, in any situation, which means that you leave very little margins, actually, to the people at the end of the chain you know, to, to, to exercise judgment and do the right thing. Uh, so I think that we, we need to find ways, and I think this is also what Ignazio to some extent hinted to. I mean, instead of having a system that constrains too much, you need to find ways to gradually trust more mm -hmm. down the ladder, you know, all, the, all the institutions, all the agencies, and then maybe have much tougher exposed checks, exposed accountability mechanisms, consistency checks that allow to make sure that you, 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 you don't use abuse of this discretion which is, uh, which is granted to you. But again, if, you, if the more we, we remain locked into this system, which is very much based on lack of trust, so let's write everything in the marble of the rules, and then let's constrain each and, and everybody of us to a, a precise ex ante behavior, the more we will be able to deliver the, uh, the goods, the public goods, that uh, the, the citizens should expect of us. Thank you very much. Probably Ignacio might want to comment, but I'm going to just uh, get two more quick questions and then hopefully take a few audience questions, at which time we'll also come to you for your thoughts. Uh, Andrea, Sir Jonathan in his remarks posed the question, how many rule books does the SSM apply, one or 20? taking us, of course, to the topic of supervisory convergence. And um, I was again looking at some remarks uh, by Sabina Lautenschläger recently where she listed all the different things that the ECB is doing to promote convergence in the culture of supervision, but she also said we can't do this alone. What can you do to work with national authorities in order to promote that kind of convergence that hopefully can be a foundation for trust? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, we, we cannot always look only to the part of the glass which is half empty. I mean, the progress we made in terms of building a single rule book at the European level is massive. I mean, we have uh, moved, uh, we didn't have any regulation in the, in the banking area that I remember of uh, before uh, 2000. Uh, 10, 11, I can't remember when the, the so uh, I mean, we have had, now we have a lot of rules which are directly applicable to all the banks throughout the union, and, and that has been a massive improvement. Um, and, uh, uh, and we have a single supervisor that actually uh, defines how these rules are applied, uh, are applied in practice. You're right that different uh, cultures uh, uh, remain, and the, the, the effort to bring them uh, closer is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a massive one. I was meeting uh, a few weeks ago, I, I, I was uh, talking to Jean-Claude Trichet, because I remember when I was here at the ECB at the start uh, uh, with Ignazio in the, in the early 2000s, I mean, I remember that uh, also the start of the, of the monetary policy side of the ECB was not, let's say, as, uh, I mean, there were indeed different, uh, notwithstanding a long preparation, much longer than the one that we had in supervisory areas, there were different cultures. And there was a period that uh, was needed before this was brought uh, not to a, to a com I remember that the first times that governors started speaking publicly 
promoting and defending decisions taken at the ECB. I mean, it took quite a while before they got there. And still now we don't see yet, uh, we're not yet there on the supervisory side. Uh, but uh, uh, the fact that we in the supervisory board work together, meet every three weeks, and spend one, two days together discussing issues, I see more and more, you know, uh, members of the supervisory board taking an interest, reading papers, uh, uh, making questions, investigating banks on which they have no direct interest in their jurisdiction. So interpreting more their role as member of a European board. This is not yet, there are still a lot of national cultures, but let's say it's a, it's a cold fusion that uh, we need to you know, bring together uh, slowly but steadily. <laughs> I must say I wondered hearing Professor Tavellini's presentation whether you found that discouraging or? Well, no, I find it, uh, let's say, uh, again, I find it uh, uh, encouraging f from a number of point of views, but also indicating the right, uh, the right directions that we need to take. I mean, uh, I mean uh, Education is an important element also in the supervisory area. I mean, the, the, the stuff we are doing on training, for instance, is, uh, is, uh, is very important. I mean, uh, if, you, if you create a, a, a very important training hub for supervisors that when they become examiners, the first, time, the, the first thing they learn, they learn them uh, under the ECB umbrella uh, together with supervisors from other, from other countries, I mean, this changes culture. Thank you very much. So very quickly to our third guiding question, uh, <laughs> UK banking and relations to UK banking after what might or might not be Brexit. Um, so let me first um, come back to what Sir Jonathan uh, Fowle suggested. He said uh, we could use the analogy of a bridge based on equivalence of rules and enforcement practice with outcomes tested regularly reciprocal market access and a coordinated approach in international fora. So with that in mind, yesterday I read the following remark by uh, ESMA, or let's say the pronouncement uh, by ESMA that if there is a hard Brexit, EU investors must trade 6,200 named stocks, including 14 UK shares within the EU and not in <laughs> London whereupon the head of the UK Financial Conduct Authority answered the UK is the most equivalent country in the world, suggesting that it might not be quite as easy as it might have sounded. Um, what do you make of all of that, uh, Sean? Uh, are these just shots across the bow at the moment or um, something to be, in fact, quite concerned about? No, I mean, I think you have to, you have to understand the context of the of the conversation yesterday. So we are contingency planning at the moment. Okay? So we are preparing for a no deal Brexit. And these comments were made in the context of statements that have been made around the no deal Brexit. It's a matter of law. There are trading obligations which lead ESMA to make the statements they have done. In fact, ESMA are being rather flexible in their statements. If they were to apply the law in the, the rather uh, literal way, the list probably would have been an awful lot longer and there would have been an awful lot more aggression in what they have to say. So I think what they're saying is because we have a no deal Brexit, because we've not been able to talk about this bridge that Jonathan has talked about, and we, this is the future relationship. We have not started talking about the future relationship. We've not been able to because we've had to wait because of the political context until the withdrawal agreement is done. That has taken an awful lot longer than people expected, if, even if, it, if it's going to be done. So you, in a contingency, this is the conversation we have. Okay. Now, in the context of the future relationship, I think we have made it clear. There was an, a short conversation about mutual recognition, which didn't last very long. It didn't last very long because in the end, neither side really wanted it, because the interesting thing about equivalence-based regulatory cooperation is that both sides retain autonomy to move in and out. This does not mean, of course, they're going to move in and out these arrangements kind of willy-nilly every day, but it does allow you a certain degree of autonomy. Um, and so I think there's no disagreement between either the UK or the EU about Jonathan's bridge. Now, where we will end up on that bridge, what point on the bridge we will end up is a matter for 
uh, negotiation. But I think what is important for us to understand is that you know, there's a kind of few unchangeable things. Firstly, Brexit is by definition fragmented. The United Kingdom on the 30th of March becomes a third country. To the extent that we have financial risk today in the UK within the European framework of law, cooperation, supervision, etc., it goes outside on the 30th of March. And you know, we have to decide, and the UK have to decide, how they want to distribute that risk. So it, the conversation tends to be a lot about value added, you know. I mean, can we steal the, you know, the, the business from London? It, it should be seen in terms of risk. How comfortable are we as the European Union 27 with how much, how comfortable are we with the amount of risk we have today and what will make us comfortable? And that's a question first of efficiency. So what is the effective way to manage your risk, but also accountability? Because if anything goes wrong, you know, I uh, and the SSM will not be accountable to the UK Parliament, we'll be accountable to the European and national parliaments here in Europe. So you have to organize your risk both effectively but also in terms of accountability. And that, I think, is the discussion about the bridge. And it's not just for the European Union because, you know, the UK has a financial sector ten times its GDP. It also has to think about how much of our risk it wants to manage and on what terms. Uh, because if something goes wrong, there are implications for them too. But this is the sort of future relationship discussion that we haven't even started having yet. And the discussion you mentioned there is a sort of stressed conversation taking place in the um, context of emergency planning. A lot of those going on right now, I think. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Philip, can I ask you to just perhaps step back and um, give us your perspective on the bridge, uh, both as uh, someone working for a very large US company and as uh, a Swiss uh, observer of all of this. What do you think the bridge needs to look like and what, uh, what concerns you most watching all of this transpire? Well, I would say as a Swiss, um, I'm, I've been very sad all along to observe that as a country, the UK does not seem to have studied the Swiss case. Um, <laughs> Which is a real pity because you actually had a, uh, you know, a very long history, a 10-year negotiation that led to the bilateral accord. So there was a lot of information that one could have gleaned by just studying it. And the, to kind of reduce it to the simple lesson, uh, it's very straightforward. You can't have the cake and eat it too. I mean, it just doesn't work. Um, for many of the reasons that were indirectly mentioned here about this being a legal construct, a very complicated one, Rules, laws are very important when you're trying to integrate and, and, and have a construct with so many sovereign uh, countries, you know, uh, part of it. And so I think it's very sad to see that that lesson clearly somehow got lost um, in this perhaps understandable, some people say it goes back to the corn laws, you know, sort of excitement, emotional excitement about um, independence and so forth. Um, so I think now what do we take from that in going forward? Um, I would say, number one, we, we don't know. The good news about yesterday's council, it seems to me, although I only had time briefly this morning to, to look at it, but it, it seems to me the good news is that it is now effectively entirely in the hands of London to decide whether or not we're going to have a hard Brexit. Um, that seems to me a good outcome from yesterday. Uh, so responsibilities will be clearly allocated as well in the event of different outcomes. Uh, secondly, as a financial market participant, the one thing I would say is markets are more adaptable than people think. And they adapt more quickly. So there's no you know, God-given right that just because London is so dominant and so big today that it will remain that way. Uh, markets adapt more than one might think over time. Um, the, the, the only additional thing I would say here, because let's be honest, we, nobody knows how this is going to play out, in the, certainly not in the worst case scenario. Uh, the one thing I'm pretty convinced about, 
and I see this from within, as he said, an American organization. By the way, Guido, uh, uh, having now been, since I left central banking in a very American organization, I could corroborate everything your very sophisticated, wonderful paper showed today. Uh, the differences between any European amongst themselves in BlackRock is far less significant than the difference between all of us and the Americans. So I think <laughs> your paper, uh, I can only confirm that. Uh, but the, the, the only other point I would want to make, Melinda, is that we should not underestimate in a worst case scenario the tendency of US corporations, US financial markets, US activities to retrench back to the US. So, you know, if there is a sort of sense that perhaps a sense of hidden excitement in Europe, that somehow a worst case scenario could lead to this great immediate resurgence of uh, the great historic financial centers of Europe, <laughs> I would be a little cautious. Um, certainly the, the sort of US dominated part of the financial center in London. Some of it, of course, will have to move to Europe. And as I said, I think adaptation will be greater than, than we think. But the instincts of the industry and the central tendency will be, in a sense, to repatriate as much as you possibly can and serve the global clientele and the global world to the extent that you can from uh, New York. So I think you know, this is uh, something I've been saying to many of my European friends for a long time. Don't, don't assume uh, that this kind of automatically, in the worst case scenario, leads to a great shift uh, to Europe. The instinct will be to simply go back to the way, in a sense, if you look at the history, how, how Wall Street began to service the world, or Europe in particular. It was very much in that model, kind of you keep as much as you possibly can in New York and you serve from there. And, and technology has made that easier, arguably, than it mm -hmm. used to be. Uh, now, there are some counter trends. Clients demand local service, local presence. So that's something you, know, you have to respond to your clients' needs. But I think, ironically, technology makes it easier to, uh, to retrench and serve the, the global clientele from New York. So I think Europe needs to be thoughtful about both the adaptation of this, the, the speed of the adaptation, but also that a lot of this will actually pull back to, to New York. Thank you. I'd like to take a couple of audience questions now, if we have one in the back of the room. OK, let's take those three, and then possibly come to Ignacio as well. Yeah, thanks a lot for an inspiring discussion. Uh, when you look at the economics of banking in Europe today with uh, book, uh, uh, well, price to book uh, significantly below one, with returns on equity which are fairly low in many countries. As an economist, you would think that there could be two possible explanations. One is uh, overcapacity, and the other one is that uh, book value is overvalued, possibly because loans, particularly non performing loans, are overvalued. So, if you take that economist's perspective and look at sort of uh, what we've done economic policy-wise, it could look a little bit that we've taken a page out of the Japanese playbook, which we ridiculed 20 years ago, and we've applied massive forbearance, uh, and it, which is supported by the fact that when you look at some of the non-performing loans in banks in Europe today, there's no way these banks are going to be solvent if you mark them to market. And second, that we haven't had the instrument which the Americans have had in terms of taking capacity out. In short. BID hasn't worked, and we've been careful to recognize the state of the Europe's banking industry's balance sheet because we can't apply BID. How do we get out of that situation, particularly in a situation where a likely economic downturn uh, over the next couple of years are going to change the otherwise beneficial path of NPLs? NPLs will not decline, but they will increase. So the question, how do we avoid being Japan too? Thank you. Can you pass it over to the other gentleman in that back row? I think you also had your hand up. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, please. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to bundle the questions, yeah. then we'll come for answers. Um, quick question for Mr. Hildebrand. So I guess having this European champion, in fact, means having one or two banks break into the club of very few global banks that enjoy extra profits. The question would be, 
from your perspective, do you think there is room for one, two more banks in that club? Or given the, the market structure, there's really, it's very mm -hmm. unlikely. And if it's possible, given the current situation, would you think that these one or two banks that might join this club are more likely to come from Europe or from somewhere else? Thank you. Then I had one here as well. Stiani Asbitz, uh, Single Resolution Board. I would like to ask uh, uh, distinguished panelists one, one, uh, to comment on, on one fact that despite the mm, 20 years since inception of, of uh, Euro, five years since inception of the single supervisor mechanism, three years uh, since inception of a uh, single resolution board, we still uh, deal with the fact that only uh, six to eight percent of the total uh, uh, balance sheets of the European banks uh, consists of uh, cross-border credits uh, that we uh, see even uh, lower uh, percentage in terms of the cross-border deposits. Uh, is this the reason why we don't see uh, uh, more significant steps toward uh, more banking union or is this the consequence of not mm -hmm. having? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Chicken egg. <laughs> um, okay, then let's do those and then Ignacio, or do, you want to, do you want to speak now and then? Okay, can we bring the microphone please to Ignacio? Here it's on its way. On the question of um, supervision and how it applies pillar two, that was um, one of the points made by myself and by Andrea. The, the, the point I try to make is that in my view, the supervisor should be able to um, set its pillar two requirements in a transparent, uh, predictable, to some extent, to a large extent, consistent and systematic way without being afraid of that becoming a quasi law. Mm -hmm. Because that is going to be then blocked from you know some some quarters, and so that one way is the one that uh, Andrea suggested to to have a little bit of a retreat of the pillar one component. Uh, I have to remind him, and I realize that I'm getting into your previous house that there is an issue also of boundary between the EBA, the secondary regulator, and the direct supervisors, because many things that are left open by the level one legislative then are passed on to the EBA. And then there is a question of finding the right burden sharing or task sharing between the EBA and, and, uh, and the direct uh, supervisors. Thank you. So let me ask, uh, perhaps, uh, Philip, you could get us started, comment on uh, the Japanese playbook and how we get out of this uh, sort of frozen situation and if you like also room for more champions and where do, where could they come from and if you wish to speak to either of the other two oh, cross-border lending uh, as well yeah very good and frankly tough questions um, Tim Geithner who had lived in Japan of course and knows Japan very well knew exactly what he was doing in in March 2009 when he boldly, and this was very aggressive, basically said, okay, you recapitalize or we recapitalize you. Um, I, by the way, I'm not sure, Tim is not here, so I'm going to be careful, but I, I'm not sure he actually had the money of that backstop <laughs> uh, in his pocket, uh, uh, which made me admire him even more in a sense, how bold this was, right? Um, now, it worked. Uh, for the most part, uh, even though everybody, and I remember being in these meetings, all these bankers saying, there's no way we can raise capital at these prices. It's impossible. And guess what happened? They just had to dilute even more. Um, and for the most part, they did it. In a couple of cases, the government had to come in. Europe did not do that. So that, to me, to this day, was in a sense the original sin. And, you know, just to give credence to the importance of the banking part of the, the broader ECB mandate, I still think to this day that not having been forceful on recapitalization is probably the, the more important explanatory factor in the lack of everything that we've seen in terms of the European recovery than the delay in QE. Uh, that is not typically what traditional central bankers or, or a lot of academics seem to have a different view on this. But to me, it's pretty clear that that was the original sin. That's the main reason why we struggled so long. And the problem, of course, was 
you know, maybe we were lacking somebody as courageous as Tim. It was more complicated because you had many countries. And for the most part, the sovereign wasn't prepared to sort of say, you either do it in the marketplace or we're going to do it for you. Um, and I think a lot of it follows from that. And, and I know, you know, having spent a lot of time in Japan in those days as well, Tim knew exactly what he was doing because he had that experience in mind. And in a sense, we're still working through that, right? We're still working through that. We still have uh, balance sheet issues. Uh, as you mentioned, we still have NPLs. So now how do we go from here? Because there's no point in replaying history. I think it's just going to take time, uh, which is why we have to kind of take the long road. Now, the good news is, and Andrea said this, if you actually look at despite all this, what has happened is still quite remarkable. In 2012, I remember being at a group of 30 meeting in London at the Bank of England when Mario basically said, we need to do banking union. And you know, the progress since then is, is quite remarkable. Yeah. So yes, we're still lacking many things, uh, but I think this will move forward and it will just take time to grind down these NPLs. It will take time to gradually, gradually use some of the revenue if it starts to come in to kind of build it down. And this is where the, the, the supervision at the level of the ECB, at the central level, will be so critical because at the national level, the temptation to kind of be captured again politically, uh, as we're seeing in a number of countries, will be very, very great. And so, the, you know, you just have to, you have a very important job to do, frankly, and it's going to take time. We should also not forget that some of these things are not related to lack of progress or not, right, in terms of banking union. You know, the, the, the yield curve, the low interest rates, that's a reality. That takes a big chunk of earnings out of most banks. Uh, these are big numbers. Um, if you just had 100, if, if we just had the yield curve of the U.S., we could work down these NPLs a lot quicker than we can currently. Uh, the fact that we have a hard time in many countries uh, laying off people because of labor market rigidities and therefore some of the traditional things textbook that you would do is gain synergies, merge banks and basically reduce headcount. That's pretty hard to do in a lot of countries. So that's something again that has nothing to do with supervision but is an impediment to further consolidation. So I think all this leads me to think we shouldn't get we shouldn't be depressed but it will take time. There's no silver bullet. This is grinding away uh, to clean up these balance sheets. And in a sense, you can think of it in the most simple way is we catch up over time what Tim and his colleagues did in one sweep, bold move in March 2009. Thank you. Let me go straight down the panel and ask anybody who wishes to comment on any of the other points that were made. Okay, maybe just to, just to say, I, I, I have no idea either whether Tim Geithner had the money or not, <laughs> but I can tell you certain member states in Europe did not have the money. So this is part of the reason why uh, they didn't inject huge amounts of cash. That being said, I agree with you that the characteristics of the two crisis response in the United States and Europe is that one was pretty sharp and decisive and the other one was done over a very long period of time. The ultima ratio sort of logic was there. We only intervened when we had to intervene at the last minute and then to the least amount possible. So this, I think, has... By the way, it costs a lot of money, right? Exactly. The one thing that's always lost in Germany, the most cost so far of the crisis has not been on the sovereign side with Greece and so forth to the German taxpayer, but has been on the banking side. Yeah. So, I so mean, the net cost of it was, was actually well, high. As ever, when you don't respond to crisis aggressively, you <coughs> tend to pay more in the long <coughs> run. Just to come back on the BRD and whether it's working or not, I think... We have to go back to a conversation we had in 2000 and whatever, 12, 11, when all of this was in our head. We had, a, in the BRD, a steady state framework. When you have no NPLs and you have lots of bailable material, this is going to work pretty well, I think. <laughs> but we don't have a steady state. We have lots of NPLs and we don't have all that much bail in material, and what's more, we don't have the bail-in material lined up in the banks that have the NPLs, because the paradox is, when you have lots of NPLs, you don't get right. to issue EMRA, at least not at prices that you can afford. So this is an issue 
we have with the framework and we're going to have to work our way through it. We've put in place the steady state. We were in, in this case, we were in a hurry to put in place that framework. We might have thought about going a bit slower, but we're all wiser uh, after the event. And because of that, we're going to have to manage that legal framework. Beyond that, we will have a cultural issue because bail-in is in the law. We have to see whether bail-in is now in, is, is in the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a strong culture in Europe of liquidating banks. I think even in the crisis, you can name on probably one hand, maybe you have to use a second hand to calculate the number of banks that we actually let out of the market. And the reality is that bailout has proven to be extremely unpopular, particularly in the crisis because it was so big. Uh, but bail-in is not fundamentally easier. And those of us who had to do a little bit of it have discovered that, that bail-in has a politics all of its own. So bailout has one political dynamic. Bail-in has a somewhat different political dynamic. But they have political dynamics. They are hard processes to manage. So we will have to develop a culture. And we will have to develop it because I think you're right. It's not just about NPLs. It's about excess capacity. We have to let some of these banks out uh, of the market. But that's just me thinking without my commission hat on, because if I put my commission hat on, I'm going to tell you the BRD is wonderful and is working really, really well. <laughs> um, I think a banking union, bank integration, it's kind of, I think you do need banking union to get to this point. But you know, we had a very diversified banking system before the crisis. It just was an integrated banking system on the wrong assumption. The assumption was that you would have a if you had a euro crisis, you'd have a euro response, and that euro response would have lots of taxpayers' money. Uh, when that particular misapprehension was revealed, everybody went home, because that's where they thought their best chance of being saved was. Yeah. Now we have to rebuild the cross-border banking model based on a different uh, set of assumptions, that we have central bodies. We have you and the single resolution board. We have the single supervisor. And instead of the taxpayer bailout, you're going to have the creditor bail-in. Uh, we've got the structure. We've not yet, I think, got the culture. And because we don't have the culture or the trust, we're not going to get these sorts of diversifications. And by the way, on, on the doom loop, I wanted to say I still haven't made my mind up yet whether this isn't chicken and egg as well. Yeah. There was no doom loop before the crisis. In <coughs> Ireland, no banks held any amount of Irish bonds after the crisis stacked up like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So do you need to get rid of the doom loop to have an integrated banking sector? Or do you need to think about how you might integrate your banking sector to actually solve mm -hmm. the doom loop? And this is very important because some people are pushing RTSE, the regulatory treatment of sovereigns, sorry, changes in the reg as being necessary to create an integrated banking system. Mm -hmm. Maybe. We will, we will have to see. Uh, and, and on pillar two and pillar one, when I meant complications, I meant vis-a-vis -vis the EBA, not us. I agree with uh, Andrea that the level of detail in pillar one is ridiculous. I mean, I have never seen formulas in primary law before, before I started working on the legal side. I mean, you have square roots. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how many of your national legislators would feel comfortable <laughs> making a speech about a square root. <laughs> <laughs> I know where I come from, it wouldn't. But there are square roots in this one. There are integrals in some parts of the other ones. So, you know, we do need to get that balance better. But we would see it as going to the EBA. But, of course, that's another discussion that we, we could have. But I certainly agree that we have become too, too much. De but I have to be honest with you. The direction of travel is in the other way. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very brief question, uh, a comment uh, from our last two panelists, and then we will take our lunch break, which we're a little bit. Okay, late. very quickly. Uh, the glass half full, half empty. It's not empty anyway, and a great deal has been achieved, and we're here to celebrate achievement, but we know that there is still a long way to go. Uh, trust is absolutely right. We don't have enough of it, despite the graphs about how similar we all are. Uh, when you sit in a room with ministers from different countries, uh, national interests are not aligned, uh, uh, it's tough. What, was the US bluffing? We'll never know. Uh, it worked. Uh, I think the key takeaway from that is it wouldn't work in Europe. You can't, nobody would think about bluffing like that because uh, it would be exposed. 
uh, and whoever was trying to do it would be fired. Uh, finally, on the algebra, I remember when my staff brought to me early drafts of uh, uh, CRD and CRR with pages of algebra. Now, I'm a dumb lawyer, and I finished mathematics at school about the age of 14, so I had no idea what this meant. But I did have the instinct, I remember, to say, why are we doing this in legislation? The ministers won't understand it with great respect. Even the honorable members of parliament won't understand it. <laughs> why is that not left to somebody else lower down the chain? And they said, because, uh, already then, they said, because the people at the top of the chain will not trust the people lower down the chain to make the discretionary judgments. So they will want the algebra, even if they only dimly understand it, in the official journal. Uh, and by the way, it's easy to translate from one language to another because it's all algebra. <laughs> um, but uh, so that's why you get the algebra. And Sean, Sean I mean, it's this deeply dismaying. I'm sure you're right that the, the direction of travel is to continue to do that even more rather than to, do, to offer discretion further down the line. It won't work. I mean, the system will be too brittle. Uh, and we just have to hope that the next crisis doesn't expose that. Uh, and if it does, it happens in a very long time. But it's not the right way to do this job. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think we may find that trust in the face of heterogeneity will be a common thread in all of our panels uh, throughout the day. Andrea. Well, uh, I need to say two words on the, on the issue of NPLs. I mean, I agree with what was said. I remember there was a very nice chart, actually, by a BlackRock analyst showing the comparison between US, Japan, and the EU, no? uh, taking the first day of the crisis and see how long it takes to reach the peak and then go down to pre-crisis level. Uh, and uh, it is clear that the, 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 the US were very fast in, in recognizing the problem and very fast in running it down. Japan was very long in recognizing the, pr the problem, so it took nine years to get to the peak. And then when they got there, eventually they, they managed to, 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 to grind it down. We were relatively good in terms of recognizing the problem, but slow in dealing with it, because we didn't have, as, uh, as everybody has said, uh, the capability. But let me say that, uh, I mean, here I need uh, to pay tribute to the people who have been here before me, including Ignazio. Let's say the SSM, the ECB, has given a tremendous push to the reduction of NPLs. I mean, what has happened in the last uh, two years is amazing in terms of reduction. And uh, also putting in place mechanisms not to have big build-ups going forward. I think this is a big, big institutional improvement with respect to the, pa to the past. On the point of cross-border integration, let's say it is, first of all, it is true. If you look at the BIS international banking, it's clear that uh, the um, Deglobalization is actually a disintegration in European markets. It has been only Europe, basically. In other jurisdictions, we have had a declining cross-border banking, then it came back to the pre-crisis level. We remain flat well below the pre-crisis level. But in, in my view, there is a more fundamental issue. I remember I, I started working in supervision in eight, 1988 when the second banking coordination directive was issued. At the time, there was the idea that with a single passport, you would have had a lot of branching across uh, member states and a lot of remote provision of services, so without even the establishment. And this didn't materialize for very, let's say, economic reasons. I mean, uh, you need to have the local brand there, and people don't trust this provision of services uh, remotely, and in some cases, it didn't work. Think of the Icelandic banks and the like. Uh, so this is a big legacy. I, I, in my hometown in Italy, a small hometown, um, you had uh, Career Agricole who bought the local savings bank uh, in 2006, 8, I think. And uh, it took more than 10 years before the Credit Agricole brand appeared in front of the branches. No? So you, 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 but now it's changing. And th th that's my final point. I think the new technology can change this quite a lot. I mean, my daughter never goes to the branch, doesn't care where the branch is. Uh, they, they, they work on completely different tools. And this could help maybe boosting up also retail integration uh, in, in, in services much more than, than is the case right now. And on pillar two, I completely agree with, uh, with Ignazio. The I, I will not elaborate on the point on the EBA, but the point is clear that you need to go down in terms of leaving more uh, responsibility to the supervisors. But the point he mentioned is the most important one. You need to have them become 
predictable and more transparent. I mean, if you have eventually in private investors that take losses if things go wrong, they need to know uh, in advance where you put the bar and how you do your job. Thank you very, very much to all of you. Let's give them a warm round of applause, please. And we take a break now. We take a break now for lunch, which you will find outside. We're starting significantly late, but if you can nonetheless be back more or less on time, that would be wonderful so that we can move on with our next panel. Thank you. I mean, we're having this discussion now about steady state.